Well, if you have your Bibles, open to the book of James. The book of James chapter 1. Uh, we started going through James last week. We did a brief introduction to James. And this morning we're going to go through verses 2 through 12 in chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the chair in front of you. You can grab that. Uh, please do follow along with us as we begin going through this great, great epistle of James. James 1, beginning in verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him who asks in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beauty perishes so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. This is the word of the living God. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. We pray as we enter into the second week, the epistle of James and studying his work, Lord. We, we pray that the, the, the Scripture would speak to us, that it would be applicable to the things that we face, but we would read it in context knowing, Lord, that your servants many years ago faced the same things, if not worse, than we do today. We thank you for your word that is sufficient in all of the things that we face. It's in Jesus' name that we pray this morning. Amen. There is a widely, widely popular myth within evangelicalism, within Christianity, and I know that you've probably heard it, and that is this, that many people believe that when they come to faith in Christ, that somehow God owes them a life that is free of hardship and that everything goes their way, and if you come to Jesus, you're going to get this great, great life that's, that's unlike the lost man. Because the lost man suffers in life, but we Christians, uh, we're not supposed to go through things. And, and therefore, when we go through suffering as believers in Christ, if we've been sold this bill of goods that God is a genie in a bottle and He owes us nothing but good things, then we begin to doubt God, but we're doubting in a wrong version of God. We're not doubting in the true God because we've yet to see Him through Scripture if we believe this. This morning, James points this out. He deals specifically in speaking to the sufferings and trials that we as Christians undergo. And I know this is very, very applicable to your life and my life because we all face trials. And many people in the church will ask in the midst of their trials, why has God allowed this to happen to me? Why are these things happening in my life? And, and at times we struggle for answers, even as believers. But the only reason we struggle is because we're dic disconnected from the Word of God. So this morning, I want us to go through this and, and look at this. Number one, before we get started, to have the mindset that as believers, that we're owed a great life, uh, free of suffering, free of pain, free of trials, that's not only to neglect what the Scriptures say, but it is to neglect church history in general. Very briefly, in 303 AD, a man named Saint Victor Marius was arrested by the Roman Emperor Maximum for preaching the gospel, for ministering to the saints. This is history, by the way. They took him, they arrested him, threw him in prison, chained him up, and as history tells, Victor converted a few of the guards by preaching the gospel the same way the Apostle Paul did. This made Emperor Maximum extremely upset. He took Victor, St. Victor, out of the stockades and he basically put him before an altar. And he said, you need to recant your beliefs in Christ and you need to bow before this altar of Jupiter, which was a false god. And as history recounts, Victor kicked over the altar in front of Maximus, the emperor, and said, I believe in Christ Jesus and no other. History goes on to tell us that the emperor had Victor ground 
by a wheat grinder into powder. He never once recounted his faith in that. Think of a story of William Tyndale, who's responsible for translating the Bible into English. By the way, without William Tyndale and his sacrifice for Christ, we would not have or possess an English translation of the Word of God. The Roman Church, the Catholic Church, could not stand Tyndale for this. And they hunted him voraciously and finally caught up to him. And when they caught up to him again, they asked him in the same way to recant. Tyndale would not do this. And they were so vicious towards William Tyndale, they hated him so much for his faith in Christ that they strangled him to death. And after they strangled him, they burned his dead body. And after that, for good measure, they sprinkled gunpowder around and blew him up. This is Christians throughout history. This is only two that I've spoken of this morning, but this is what we see throughout history. Men and women standing up for their faith that were greatly persecuted. And we haven't even got to the scriptures yet this morning. By the way, this happened to Tyndale in 1536. Cultural, cultural Christianity, and what we're looking at this morning opening, opening up, tells us that this is not right. Cultural Christianity, somebody who is not grounded in the Word of God, will say, look, I'm owed this, this prosperity theology type of belief, but again, it is to neglect the Scriptures and hundreds of years of church history. Also in the Scriptures, Jesus gives this altar call, if you will, to those who would follow Him. Listen to this. In Luke chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus says, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down, listen, and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Jesus didn't begin by telling people, look, if you follow me, here's the great things that are going to happen. Here's the wonderful things you're going to get from following me. Jesus opened up by saying, listen, you need to count the cost of what it's going to take to follow me. You need to realize there's going to be sacrifice. Uh, you could lose many things. You could lose your relationship. You could lose your status. You could even lose your life. That was applicable back in the day of Christ, and it is the same today. There are missionaries spread across the world that are losing their lives for Christ this very day because they refuse to recant what they believe. See, Jesus' method of evangelism wouldn't be very popular today in most churches. It would be shunned because what is popular is everything's going to be great. Come and sign the membership rules uh, and we'll plug you into the church. But again, Jesus says in the verse in Luke 14, listen, count the cost. Look back through church history. Look through your scriptures to what it cost my disciples, my followers, because you may be of the same blood. And you may suffer in the very same way. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 9, it says this. Jesus says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my namesake. Again, He's not really conducive to getting people to follow Him, is He? I mean, He's not a great salesman here, is He? He's telling the truth, though. You're going to be hated by nations, by other people, for Christ, for my namesake. Evangelist named Paul Washer said this, Christ promises us two things, eternal life and a cross to die on. And James is pointing out this morning as we begin to read, if a Christian views suffering through the lens of Christ, it proves they are truly one of His. You see, the way we suffer is a test of faith. Last week opening up in James, I pointed out that the book of James is more or less a list of tests of the faith. How the believers can see, am I truly walking with Christ? Am I truly one of His? And it's viewed, one of the first tests is how we suffer. Now I want to preface this because I did this last week. Any time that we go through the scripture and talk about a testing of faith, I never want to read, I never want anybody to read the scripture and, and look at an area where they're lacking and begin to doubt their faith. Now, sometimes maybe we should begin to question our faith, but overall, if you have a spirit of repentance, if you see in the Scripture where you are lacking and you are repentant in your heart, this bothers you, that's a sign that you're one of His. 
God's given you that gift of repentance uh, to follow through and know where he can grow, excuse me, grow you in the faith. James encourages us in suffering. Now, brief recap from last week. We just did a brief introduction. We spent about 40 minutes on James chapter 1 verse 1. That's the only verse we really concentrated on looking at who James was. So very briefly, let me read this again. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion Greetings. Now, if you weren't here last week, I, I just want to set the context for us to catch you up. James is the one writing this epistle. James is the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Uh, and James really is the best apologetic defense for someone to believe in Jesus. We talked about last week that James, through the scriptures we can read, don't have time to go back this morning, James didn't believe that his half-brother Jesus was God. Didn't believe they thought he was insane, his brothers and sisters. But James changed his tune when he saw his brother rise from the dead. That's what it took. And James went on to write the historic epistle of James and was martyred for his faith. Died a horrible fate of being thrown off a temple and clubbed to death because he would not back off of saying, Jesus is Lord. Again, I always want you to see this. This is biblical, but also I'm, I'm telling you history here. That there are men and women, and James is one of them, who would definitely say today, look, I didn't believe he was God either, but I saw him rise from the dead. Historically saw him rise from the dead. And James goes on to be one of the leaders of the Jerusalem church, and he's writing to persecuted believers. Look again at verse 1 in James chapter 1. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who's he writing to? He's writing to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Now, very briefly, the 12 tribes in the dispersion. This is Israel. These are the believers in Jesus Christ. If you remember, just going back from last week, in Acts chapter 7, a believer named Stephen preached the gospel and was stoned to death, led in the stoning by a man named Saul, who was Paul. And after Stephen was killed for his faith, the Christians in Jerusalem, because of the persecution, scattered. They dispersed. And you see the word, the dispersion. The dispersion refers to the Christians that scattered, that had to leave their hometown Jerusalem for their faith, for their persecution, because of their belief in Jesus Christ. So James is writing to Christians that have been dispersed because of their faith, and they are under great persecution. We think we're persecuted when the car won't start, don't we? These are Christians that were facing real persecution. Death for their belief. They're scattered away from their hometown. And these are who James is writing to. Look at verse 2 with me. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now, we notice a few things in this verse. Number one, James is writing to other believers. He's not writing to lost people. He says, count it all joy, who? My brothers. He's writing to believers in Christ when you meet trials of various kinds. Now joy definitely is a mark of a true believer in suffering. It's countercultural, isn't it? But read the verse again for yourself. Count it joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. This is not what we normally do, is it? When we meet trials, when I meet trials, the first thing I want to do is ask God why. We don't have a smile on our face when trials come as believers. But, but again, this is opposite. This is countercultural. James says, count it joy when you have these trials in your life of various kinds. This translation of joy is literally a complete joy. This translation of joy used here is a joy that's not forced. You know how when you have to go to a family reunion and, and see crazy Uncle Eddie there and you got the forced smile on your face just to, to make it through the day? This is not the same kind of joy James is talking about. He's talking about a genuine joy. You are genuinely joyful in your spirit when trials come. And I'll tell you where this comes from. We're going to get into this this morning. This joy comes from when you know the outcome of the suffering produces a good that was invaluable to you. Let me say again, the joy comes in suffering when you can see the outcome of the joy produces a good that is more 
precious to you than the suffering. Uh, let me get ground level with us this morning. Uh, I've never met a pregnant woman who said, listen, if I, if I knew the pain that was involved, there's no way I would have had this kid. If I knew the sleepless nights, the pain, the, the labor, uh, the contractions that are involved or were involved in this, looking back, there is no way that I would ever do that. I say praise God that ladies have been given that gift because if it was up to men, I told my wife, we would not repopulate. <laughs> Be holding hands. But I have met women, I have met mothers who say the, the exact opposite. I'd go through it again. I'd go through every bit of pain again for this child. You see, because they had their eyes on the outcome of the suffering. They knew the end goal was something precious to them. As Christians, let me ask this, is the end goal for us the glory of Christ no matter what comes our way? Do we love Jesus that much in our profession of faith that, hey, Lord, I want you to be glorified no matter if it comes at my prosperity. Hey, Lord, if it comes that way, let it happen. But if I can be more glorified, this is a, a dangerous prayer, by the way. Lord, if I can be more glorified by you grounding me to dust, then let it be so. You see, that's the same kind of joy. That joy comes because if God's glory is had through my suffering, that's a test for you and I as well. When we say, I joy, I rejoice uh, at Jesus Christ being glorified, that's a, that's a churchy phrase, isn't it? That we say a lot. We want Jesus to be glorified. Sometimes Jesus allows the trial to come in, in a way to say, do you really? Do you really want it more than anything? More than your own prosperity, more than your own health, more than even your own life. Is this more important like a woman going through childbirth, looking at the end goal of Christ? Is it more important it, through anything that your suffering be used to glorify me? That's a way we can, t we can check ourselves. Amen? We can look to see if our words truly meet the truth that we are speaking. Romans chapter 8 verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not comparable to the glory that will be revealed in us. This is the Apostle Paul who endured great suffering. And in Romans 8.18 says, listen, this was his mindset. That this suffering presently, and by the way, the, the present suffering he was going through was brutal. It's not comparable to the glory that will be revealed. Think back to the pregnant woman. The, the labor pains are not comparable to the child that will be revealed. Do you see here the, the, the level of importance? When your eyes are fixed on the outcome of suffering, when that is more precious to you than the suffering, then you can have joy in suffering. Do you see the, 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 the look at this, the analogy here? 2 Corinthians 4.17. Again, the Apostle Paul writes, For this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. This is amazing to me, this verse, Paul speaking, talking about a man who has received lashes on his back, has been beaten for his faith, has been shipwrecked, has no prosperity, lives almost as a pauper, is hunted and sought after to be killed. And he, he says, yeah, this light and momentary affliction that I have, it's nothing compared to what God has in store for His glory and my good. Do we believe this this morning? Furthermore, do we live like this? Because it's easy to check the box in your mind as we listen to go, yes, I believe that. Sure. Do we live this? Does this show in our lives? Look at verse 3. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, we'll get into what this idea of steadfastness is, but I want to give you a quick, quick little story. Uh, boxing great Muhammad Ali was 12 years old when he got ignited, rather, wanting to, to be a fighter. Many of you may know the story. At 12 years old, Cassius Clay had his bicycle stolen by a bully. It really upset him, and he ran to a police officer. The officer's name was Joe Martin, and he ran to this officer tears streaming down his face and the first thing he told the officer is I just want to club that guy who took my bike. Little did Muhammad Ali know that Joe Martin was a boxing trainer. Took Muhammad Ali under his wing, began to train him and Muhammad Ali wanted to please his trainer. 
He idolized Joe Martin for the skills that he had. And Muhammad Ali had to hone the same skills to be like his mentor. But to do that, he had to go through a lot of suffering. But getting hit in the face is suffering. He had to go through a lot of fights, a lot of suffering to be like the man he wanted to be like. Luke chapter 6 verse 40 says this, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. Are we willing to go through this testing of the faith? Do we love Jesus that much that we would say, anything it takes, anything it takes to conform me into your image, Again, whether it's by prosperity, which many of us would prefer, or whether it's by my destruction, would we be willing to say anything that it takes to be like Jesus? Leonard Ravenhill wrote this, People say, I want to be like Jesus. Well, I doubt it. Do you want to get kicked out of your family because you love God? Do you want to be so true to God that a Thomas comes and doubts you? That a Judas sells you out? Do you really want to be like Jesus? How much do you really want to be like Christ? Because Jesus' righteousness was magnified, was honed through suffering. It came through suffering. Suffering, listen, conforms you and I into His image. We've used the example before of how a sculptor chisels rock to make a beautiful sculpture. I'm sure if that piece of rock had feelings, it would be screaming. But that's what God does. Through suffering, we are conformed more and more into His image. And without suffering, we cannot produce or have godly characteristics. Let's keep going. Verse 3 again. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now this word steadfastness means patience. It means the ability to endure. A steadfastness is an inner strength that grows over time. And it's built up through trials. I've often heard many people, especially parents, pray and ask me to pray for God to give them patience. And I tell them to be careful what you ask for. Because patience, steadfastness, is built through suffering, through trials. So normally when you pray that, God's going to say, Suit up, because I'm going to give you what you asked for. And things are going to get harder rather than easier. But you will be conformed into His image through that. Look back at verse 4. And let steadfastness, that is patience, have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Look at verse 4 with me again. What's the full effect? Listen, what's the end goal of patience. What's the end goal of this steadfastness that Christ is, is seeking to implant in us through suffering? That your faith may be perfected. That you will attain a perfect peace. That you'll have perfect trust in Christ. Now can we ever have anything perfect on this earth? No we can't. We are fallen. We all fall short. We all sin. But that is the goal. That is the intent to press forward to that Perfection. No, we can't lay claim to that, but we can pursue that with everything that we have in us. And through hardships, you begin to look more like Christ and be a witness to the outside world. Can you imagine the, 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 the witness it is to see a lost person grieving, yet say in the midst of their sorrow and their lost, Jesus is Lord, He is everything, He has done this for good, not for evil. They see something different in you and I when we experience suffering like this. Theologian John Trapp wrote this, God had only one son without sin, but none without suffering. Let that sink in for a minute. God had one son, that is Jesus Christ, who was without sin, and none without suffering. So therefore, reading that, you and I can't be a follower or a son or a daughter of Christ without suffering. That's not making that verse gospel. That verse is coming from gospel. Amen? Amen? That's just an echo of what Scripture says. That if we are His, we will be hated by the world. We will be persecuted. We will have trials. A Christianity that is built on having prosperity. God giving me everything good is one built on sinking sand. Is one that will not last. Knowing God is key to enduring suffering. Look at verse 5. 
If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now we can't trust God in suffering unless you know God. Amen? It's impossible to trust God through suffering if we don't know Him. Listen, it's impossible to understand why suffering happens if we don't know Him. And where does wisdom come in the Scriptures? The wisdom of God comes from, I just gave it to you, through the Scriptures. Knowing God comes through His Word. You can't understand suffering in this world without Scripture and without the Bible. I recently had a, a Christian woman, believer, who came to me and, and she confessed. She said, I trust Jesus in everything and I've been trying to witness to my atheist friends. She said, but they, they catch me all the time. I don't know what to say when they point to things like the recent hurricanes and the destruction and the families that were killed. And the atheist will say back to her, yeah, well, if your God is so good... Why would a good God allow something like these hurricanes? Why would a good God allow natural disasters to kill people? And lovingly, I had to point this lady to, the Scripture does have an answer for this. But it's a lack of knowing God's Word that leads you to doubt. Uh, very briefly, I'll show you this. Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. This will be a great apologetic defense for you when you are witnessing to your friends because one of the, the greatest uh, just rejections of the gospel comes through this. Why would God allow bad things to happen, especially in the case of natural disasters? Why, wouldn't, why would God allow good people to die in, in a natural disaster? Listen to this. There were some uh, present at this very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now at this time, keep in context, through this... At the time, there are Christians who Pilate is killing. And there are believers asking the same question. Why, why is God allowing His people to be killed by Pilate? You see it right here. And then he answered him, that is Jesus. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will also likewise perish. Now, here's the natural disaster. Or those 18, there were 18 people on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will also likewise perish. Now, context here. People are asking. Believers are asking the question, why would God allow people that love Him to die? Why would God allow this natural disaster, uh, this tower falling and killing 18 people who believed Him? Why would God allow a hurricane to kill people? And Jesus says through the Scripture to these people and to you and I, you're asking the wrong question. The right thing to see is if you know God and if you knew the Lord of Scripture, you would see that that question is built on fault. Rather, you should be seeing that through natural disasters, through death, it should draw our minds, as King Solomon said in the recent book of Ecclesiastes we just finished, that it should draw our minds back to contemplating our own eternity. Am I right with God? Look what Jesus says in the verse in Luke. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. We're asking the wrong question when we say, why would God allow natural disasters? Jesus says, the real question is, do I have a repentant heart? Am I right with the Lord? Because there'll be a day that we all likewise perish. You see, the answers for everything that the atheist or the unbeliever or even the doubting Christian has are in the Word of God. It's just a matter of do we know them? Or rather, have we spent time seeking those answers through Scripture, through the wisdom of God? Look at verse 5 again. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. So a quick review, very quickly, of, of what we've looked at this morning. Keys to joy in suffering. If you have a pen, you can write these down. Number one, understand God's purpose in the trial. Understand that God has a purpose in the trial, in the suffering for you. Number two, if you don't understand, then let you seek wisdom. 
And you seek wisdom through God's Word. Number three, if you seek wisdom, do it fully trusting in Him without doubting. Without saying, Lord, I, I'm probably not going to get an answer to this. Lord, I'm probably going to be as lost as I was pertaining to this right now than I ever am. But do this trusting that God will show us through His Word. Because someone who comes to God already doubting is like a wave tossed in the sea. It's not steady. It's not anchored. A doubting man will always doubt hard truth and believe a soft lie. We don't want to be doubters. Doubting God is a sign of spiritual immaturity. It's also the sign of a lost person when we doubt God. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14. Paul writes, so that we may no longer be children. That, that analogy there is immature in the faith, uh, low in the kiddie pool of Christianity, so to speak. Paul says, so that we may no longer be children tossed fruit to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, deceitful schemes. You see, when we question God, when we doubt God, we're, we're proving one of two things. Number one, we are shallow or children in our own faith. Or number two, we never really believe to begin with. And it's one of those things that we have to evaluate for ourselves, seeking the wisdom of the Lord through His Word. Look at verse 9 of James 1. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and let the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. Now going back to the dispersion, after the death of Stephen, Christians in Jerusalem scattered out. They had to leave their homes, take everything that they could and scatter. They were hunted now. And many of these believers were wealthy before the dispersion came. Many of these believers had worldly things. They had a nice, comfortable life, but when persecution came, they scattered to the ends of the earth and they no longer had the positions of high power anymore. And many had high positions, many had status, but no more when the dispersion came. Now look at the verse again in verse 9. James says, Be joyful, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. This is exaltation in the Lord. You, they feel lowly because they've lost all of their worldly possessions, many of them. But James gives this encouragement. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. What exaltation? That God has exalted them and chosen them worthy enough to suffer for his name. And the rich in his humiliation... Because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. James 1 verse 11. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and beauty perishes. So, all, so will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Now this is an analogy back to the time. James writing here, uh, it's looking back first to Isaiah. Isaiah wrote about the flower withering but the word of God never perishing. Uh, at this time grass in Israel, mainly in February, if you study back history, grass was beautiful at this time in Israel. But by May the grass in Israel would become really, really scorched and dry up. So he's drawing their mind back to something they can see with their own eyes. He's saying just like you guys are familiar with the grass withering when May comes and there's not that much time in between February and May. It doesn't live that long such as the, the lifespan of a man in the eyes of God that he will in the same way wither up so therefore we've got to question how we are living our own life for God. Are we boasting in the fact that we are exalted in the creator of the universe's eyes? Or do we find our worth in stuff? I find it's ironic that we just did finish the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, I didn't plan this. Uh, God, I just been, began reading the scriptures and God began to draw me into James. I felt like it would be a wonderful book for us to go through. But it's amazing how they kind of piggyback on each other. I never thought about this. That King Solomon saying through the book of Ecclesiastes that nothing in this world can ever satisfy you. I've lived it. I've done it. I've had everything. The most wealthy king ever. And it's all meaningless. And James comes after Solomon, many, many, many years after Solomon, and basically says pretty much the same message. When you're suffering, you're exalted in God's eyes. When you have everything, and when you're living for that, you need to question if you're truly living for Jesus. Psalm 103.15 
As for man, his days are like grass. Also the psalmist wrote this as with Isaiah. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows no more. John MacArthur wrote this. The loss of material things is meant to drive the rich person to the Lord and greater spiritual maturity, blessing, and satisfaction. I would say that that goes for anything God takes away from us. Be it material things, be it a loved one, be it our possessions, whatever it is, if God sees fit to take something from us, it is not to hurt you if you are a brother or sister in Christ. Rather, it is to conform you into His image. And it may be that you have made something an idol. That's another sermon for another day. But if something to, has become more precious to us, be it our wealth, a relationship, whatever it is, God will take that away from us if He loves us so that it's no longer a stumbling block. So God chastises those that He loves. That's the book of, of Hebrews. Look at James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Now I want you to see the language here. This is the last verse that we'll cover this morning. James begins chapter 1, verse 12 here, by saying, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast, which he's already talked about, is one of the goals under trial. Blessed is the man. What does that remind you of? Anybody? The Beatitudes of Matthew chapter 5. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Blessed is this. Blessed are the ones who are meek. Blessed is, are those who mourn. You can read the Beatitudes. This is very translucent of the Beatitudes, is it not? James was familiar with Christ's sermon here. And he reminds us to go back and look. Again, if we read the Beatitudes of Matthew chapter 5, it's not all about giving us blessings. These are marks of a true believer. Again, in Matthew chapter 5, you can read those blessed statements and we can begin to evaluate the faith that we have to see if it's actually true of us. He uses the same language here that the man who remains steadfast, that is joyful, remember the word joyful, under trial, he will stand before Christ with the crown of life. And that's spoken of in the book of Revelation many times. I part with this example. Uh, the book of Job, I've used this a lot. Uh, Job lost everything. His family, his health, his children, his wealth, his prosperity. And listen, lost it all in one day. I mean, that's a bad day. I know we've all had bad days. I don't think you or I have had that day. Okay, if you have, I need to talk with you. Okay, I want to hear your story. Nobody's had that day where he literally lost everything in his life. And this is what Job said. Job chapter 1 verse 20. Then Job arose. This is after all of these things happened. He's lost his family, his wealth, everything. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground, and what? Worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave... And the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And this is so ironic to me. Verse 22. In all of this, Job did not charge God with wrong. That'll make us hang our head, doesn't it? I know how many times have we said in our life when these bad things happen. Why, God? Why would you do this? When the atheist cries, why would a good God allow these things to happen? And the faith of Job speaks volumes where he, this man loses so much, yet says he did not charge God with any wrong. The Lord gave, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We all go through, tri through trials in our life, but I want you to take away from this morning, the only thing that can keep you steadfast in this is the wisdom of God. Under trial... Your only hope is in the wisdom of God. Money's not going to help you when trials come. When you lose a loved one or go through sickness, all the wealth in the world will not make the pain any easier. But the one thing that speaks to us is the Word of God. And James says, count it a joy when you go through this. Why? 
Because God's working on you. It's a sign to you that God is allowing you to suffer to conform you more into His image. I heard a pastor one time say, we should fear more for the people, and you see these celebrities on TV and famous people who it looks like they have no suffering in their life. Romans chapter 1 attests to the man who is not in the will of God. God will allow him to run in ignorance and stand before him on that day. And God then says, now we'll talk. I've let you run without any chastisement, but now let's have a conversation. Praise God that he doesn't do that with us. Amen? Praise God that God chastises those that he loves. And that's why James could say, count it a joy. Ask yourself, in the trial, in the hardship, is the glory of God more important to you than what you're going through? And if it is, you can have joy. Because you know the outcome is for our good, his glory, and it all makes perfect sense through the wisdom of the word of God. Amen? Let's bow and go before him in prayer. Father, we thank you for the wisdom of James. We pray that this morning, uh, through, his, through his encouragement to the church, through his pressing, Lord, of suffering, that we would begin to evaluate first what the early church went through. And then, Lord, we can look at our own lives. And in comparison, as the Apostle Paul said, that these things that we go through, in comparison to what the early church face, to what many Christians nowadays are going through in persecution, in death, that these are light and momentary afflictions. There is no point in our lives in which God is not in control. There is no point in our lives where God throws His hands up. God is never shaking His head wondering how things have happened. And furthermore, as we see through the life of a man named Job, every tragedy that happens in our lives is through the hands of God. He does not cause evil, but He definitely will allow it for a further good. The perfect example of this is the cross of Jesus Christ. How at the time of the crucifixion, the followers of Jesus must have thought this was the worst thing that could ever happen. But God had a plan that through that suffering, the salvation of many would come to fruition. And in the same way in our lives, through our own suffering, through our own trials, that God has a plan if we would trust Him through the wisdom of God, and through the Word of God. I pray that that is a mark of each of us this morning. We thank you for Jesus. It's in His name that we pray. Amen.